Hello and welcome to the ninth talk of our online series, Behind the Scenes Analyzing Anglo-Saxon Rendlesham. I'm Alice DeLeo, the Project Delivery Officer for Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service, and today we'll be hearing from Eleanor Rye about the place names of South East Suffolk and what they can tell us about Rendlesham. We're pleased to be hosting this online series in partnership with two projects. Rendlesham Revealed, led by Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and Lordship and Landscape, led by Christopher Skull and funded by the Leverhulme Trust. You can find the videos of our earlier talks on our website at heritage.suffolk.gov.uk forward slash Rendlesham. I'll now introduce you to Eleanor Rye. Eleanor is an Associate Lecturer in English Language and Linguistics at University of York and is a specialist in place names and historic linguistics. Eleanor has also been involved in the interdisciplinary project called Travel and Communication in Anglo-Saxon England based at University College London. More recently, as part of the Lordship and Landscape project team, Eleanor has been exploring the place name evidence for early medieval landscape, settlement and society in South East Suffolk, as well as examining late medieval field names in Rendlesham. And we're pleased to have Eleanor here today to share some of the research. So Eleanor, when you're ready, over to you. OK, thanks, Alice, and good afternoon, everyone. So, um, so Rendlesham is famously one of the relatively few places in East Anglia recorded in Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people, um, completed by the 730s. On the slide, you can see one of the manuscripts of the text showing the name Rendlesham. Terms Rendlesham, a vicus regius, a royal settlement, when he refers to it as the place where the East Saxon King Swithhelm was baptised in the mid 7th century. As many of you will have heard in other lectures in the series, members of the Lordship and Landscape Project have identified the site of the settlement in the parish of Rendlesham near the River Deben, working with metal detectorists Rob Atfield, Roy Dummond, Terry Marsh and Alan Smith. Now today I'll be talking about the insights place names give us about Rendlesham and its local area. I'll begin by explaining how place name evidence fits into the Lordship and Landscape Project. I'll then give you a very brief introduction to where place names come from and how we study them. But after that, I'll dive into the substance of the talk. I'll begin by discussing a few things we've learned from looking at field names around Rendlesham. I'll then explain how place name evidence helps us to limit Rendlesham's possible territory. Um, and I'll spend most of the lecture talking about the clues we have from place names that Rendlesham was a pretty remarkable place, focusing on the name Rendlesham itself and relationships with other settlements in the area. Where does my place name research fit within the Lordship and Landscape project? Um, I'll be discussing today what place names can tell us about three of the project's research questions shown on the slide. So I'll be talking about how place names contributed to our reconstruction of Rendlesham's immediate territory and how this conforms to what um, the so-called river and wald model predicts. And I'll explain what that is a little bit later. I'll also talk about Rendlesham's importance in relation to social structures in the territory. And I'll talk quite a, quite a bit about Rendlesham's location, especially its proximity to other places um, in its putative territory. OK, moving on to a bit of background to the study of place names. So I'll be mentioning some languages that are used in Suffolk's place names in today's talk. I've listed the main languages found in the area's place names on this slide, alongside some rather approximate indications of when these languages were used. Some of the languages listed here clearly postdate Rendlesham's period of prominence from the 5th to the early 8th centuries. I won't be talking about these, so I won't be talking about Old Norse or Old French. Um, we also don't have much evidence for British in the area around Rendlesham. Um, so that's the um, Celtic language spoken um, since prehistory in the area. Um, so my focus will be on Old English names today, um, though Latin will also get a bit of a mention. 
So Old English was, of course, the language spoken by the Germanic speaking people of early medieval England, um, so from uh, about the fifth century um, onwards. Um, and I'll be using um, the abbreviation OE on the slides to refer to Old English. And Latin was, of course, the language brought to Britain by the Romans, um, though Germanic speaking people on the continent would already have been in contact with Latin speakers before any settlement in Britain. OK, so I'll now very quickly outline how we interpret place names. Um, so if you think about how new names are formed today, you'll realise that lots of new names involve recycling or reuse of existing names. We could think of examples like Boston in the USA, where an English place name was um, transferred, or modern street names, um, where you might find the names of other um, places or well-known people turning up in the street names. Um, well, we think this kind of naming was extremely rare in early medieval England. Instead, most place names originated as meaningful descriptive labels for places. That is, they described some aspect of the place they named. And the first step in studying an area's place names is then to uncover these descriptions. Well, how do we do this? Well, the first step is to collect early forms of place names from written documents. Um, this gets us much closer to the original form of the name. On the slide, I've given you the early spellings for Bordsey on the Suffolk coast. If you just looked at the modern name, you might think there was some connection with boards or something like that. Well, um, thankfully, nothing untoward going on over in Bordsey. The early spellings tell us that it, this isn't the case. Um, if we look at the early spellings, so ones like these shown here on the slide, you can see that we've got um, both an L and an R in the early spellings, which have now been lost. These spellings allow us to work out that the first part of this name was an Old English personal name, Boldhera, um, and that the second part was Old English A, a word for an island or a raised, um, an area of raised dry ground. Having got this far, we can stop and assess whether this is a plausible etymology. In the purely linguistic sense, in this case, we're happy. We have records called people of people called Boldhera um, um, from early medieval England. And there's a lot of evidence for the word A in Old English texts and in other place names, so this island word. And this etymology also makes really good sense in relation to the local topography. I've shown the situation of Bordsey here on dry ground, highlighted in green, um, amongst wetter marshland and areas of, um, so marshland or former marshland, um, which are shown in blue. So Bordsey certainly fits the description of an area of raised dry ground in a wetter area. OK, um, today I'll also be using some labels um, to distinguish between different types of um, place name, depending on the size um, of the place they name. The terms I'll be using are major place names, and these are names of sizable settlements or major features in the landscape. Minor place names, so as the name suggests, these are the names of smaller places, hamlets, houses and small features in the landscape, streams and small woods and so on. Um, and within this category of minor place names, um, I'll also be talking about field names, which are, again, as the name suggests, names of pieces of land that form part of the agrarian economy. Um, we can also make broad statements about the likely periods when these uh, different types of place names were formed. So most, most major place names, so names of villages and towns and so on, um, most major place names in Suffolk are recorded in the 1086 Doomsday Survey. Um, and in this case, we know that the names must have been formed by at least the 11th century. But most minor names, on the other hand, are recorded later, um, and particularly in the case of field names from Rendlesham, at least those that survive, not until the 18th or 19th centuries. Some may be survivals of much older names, but in many cases, the names probably developed either in the late medieval or the, or the modern periods.
Um, so I'm going to begin by discussing the most recent of the names I'll talk about today, modern field names. Some of the field names I'm discussing here are recorded in mid 19th century tithe award documentation. Others, um, so, and this, these tithe awards um, do, uh, documentation, this tithe award documentation includes maps and lists of um, uh, field names that go with the maps. Um, other names I'm talking about um, come from slightly earlier maps, mainly from the 18th and early 19th century, um, and these maps are now in Ipswich Record Office. Um, and on the next few slides, you'll see my digital versions of these maps. Um, so you can see some of the field names from the 19th century Tithe Award documents in the map here where I focused on the area where the finds at Rendlesham are most concentrated. So this is um, the settlement area to the north of the stream um, and the prom promontory area um, where the um, probable hall complex is located over here. Um, the field names here tell us something about land use and we can see from the medi many names incorporating the word meadow along the river Deben that the lower wetter land along the river was being used as meadowland. Other names tell us something about, tell us more about landscape, vegetation um, and features in the landscape. Um, so, for example, we could think about um, Causeway Hill up here. In this case, presumably the Causeway is going to be this road up here. Um, an older car down here, so a um, uh, uh, marshy area where older trees were growing. Um, and there's plenty of evidence um, for um, the use of various bits of land as uh, sheep forks and so on. Um, if you can see the um, um, labels, um, you'll be able to see that though we don't have any um, names indicating any particularly remarkable features here. We haven't got any King's Halls or anything like that. However, um, one field name that's worth a quick mention is Blackcroft over here. Um, this is what it sounds like, so a black piece of land. Um, now, in some cases, black in field names um, probably just refers to particularly fertile land, um, which is certainly possible here. Um, however, in others, it may refer to soil colour that is unusual in some way, either because of natural soil variation or because the soil has been darkened by ash um, or, and organic material from earlier settlements. So this name may therefore point to remains of an earlier occupation, um, though um, how early this is, um, we wouldn't be able to say just from the name. Um, and I'll just say here that I haven't um, sort of unfortunately not been able to map up, match up many of the modern field names with the field names recorded in medieval documents, um, which means that we can't locate many of the names in the medieval documents, so we don't um, um, we don't know whereabouts in Vendelsham these names um, were um, and their use to us is rather limited. Um, but there are still a few things that we've learned from looking at the field names. Um, so I will talk a little bit more. Um, I'm going to take you first to wooden halls and I'll return again to field names a little bit later on in the talk. Why am I talking about wooden halls? Um, well, Rupert Bruce Mitford um, hi highlighted this name. He noted field names called Hall and Wooden Hall in the north of the parish on an early 19th century map. Um, we could see some of them in this map here. Um, so we've got Great Wooden Halls, Little Wooden Halls, um, and then we've got some various other names, including Hall. Um, and Rupert Bruce Smithford suggested that an earthwork enclosure here might be remains of the early medieval settlement at Rendlesham. Um, so this is not the location near the Deben, which has been the focus of the project, um, which is a little um, alarming at first glimpse. Um, well, reassuringly, um, we can be pretty certain that we don't need to think, um, worry that we've been looking in the wrong place. The map on the right shows the same fields on an 18th century map surveyed by John Kirby. We can see that one of the fields here is called Wood Knolls. That's this one down here. And I think that what must have happened here is that this name was reinterpreted as wooden halls at some point, um, uh, giving us the later wooden halls name. So nothing to do with the hall at all. That's something of a relief. OK, let's move further back in time and on to the major place names. 
So as I said earlier, these are the names of villages and so on, um, and they're mainly recorded by the 11th century. So they take us back to the early medieval period, much closer to the period when Rendlesham was a royal settlement. We've tapped into the name's semantic content to help us understand the landscape around Rendlesham. One of the main things we did was to use the names to supplement our knowledge of areas of woodland. Names referring to woodland are shown on the slide here uh, with the little tree icons. Um, these word names contain words like Old English woodu, wood, holt, a single species wood, graf, a grove, and leach, probably meaning something like open woodland. Um, and the map shows these names mapped alongside soil types areas of ancient woodland and heaths and commons. As you can see, um, some of the woodland names cluster up on the heavier um, clays, especially to the north of the area, um, where there's also a lot of the surviving ancient woodland. There are also numerous woody place names um, on the more acid soils um, between Vendelsham and the coast. Um, um, and these are areas um, with a lot of heathland. Now, the survival of woodland in these areas, um, and in fact, and indeed the survival of um, the heathlands here, um, suggest that these areas on the heavy clays and on the more acid soils were less um, intensively exploited um, in terms of agriculture. Um, and this fits in with the assumptions of the so-called river and wold model um, in this area. So according to this model, the focus of um, early settlement would be in river valleys um, with upland areas or areas on more difficult soils being less intensively um, exploited and accordingly less intensively set settled. Um, and they often ended up forming territorial limits, so these um, sort of more marginal areas. Um, and I've also shown on this map the boundary of the Wicklaw hundreds. Um, as you'll know, if you were at Stuart Brooks's talk last week, um, this is the name given to a group of legal and administrative units known as hundreds in this area of Suffolk. This group of hundreds may fossilise the boundaries of an earlier territory. If it does, then you can see how these limits were, the limits were in these upland areas, which were, amongst other things, more heavily wooded. Um, so place name evidence played a part in our reconstruction of landscape and the identifications of areas most amenable to settlement. Um, uh, and Tom Williamson discussed how we used this evidence in much more detail in his lecture as part, in, as part of this series. So do watch that if you'd like to know more about these methods, which he's really the expert on. OK, so let's zoom in on the name Rendlesham itself now. So as I said earlier, um, Rendlesham is recorded in Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people. And in fact, Bede's reference is our first record um, of the name Rendlesham in a form just like this. So R-A-E-N-D-L-E-S-H-A-M. Now, there's obviously a lot that's relevant to our understanding of early medieval Rendlesham in this short um, extract from, from Bede. Um, but the point of interest for my talk today is that Bede provides an interpretation of the place name Rendlesham interpreting it as Mancio Rendili, so Rendell's residence. Um, and this interpretation makes a lot of sense. The second place name element, so the second word in this place name, is evidently Old English harm, a word which means homestead or dwelling place, so a fairly general term for a settlement. Um, we don't have any records of anyone from early medieval um, England called Rendell, so we don't know who this Rendell might have been. Um, but the name is perfectly plausible, not the personal name. Personal names containing um, the element on which this name is based, so that would be Rand, are recorded amongst Germanic speaking peoples on the continent and in medieval Scandinavia. And um, adding a common suffix used in personal names ill would give us this name, Rendel. Now, this etymology isn't the only one that's been suggested. Um, another suggestion has been that the first element is instead a noun uh, of identical form, so rendel, um, a diminutive form of an Old English word rand, which probably meant something like border or strip, um, though in Old English it's recorded mainly, it's recorded in the meaning of shield. Um, and this etymology was suggested by um, Margaret Gelling, um, who comes up again later, very famous place name scholar. Um, and for reasons I'm not going to go into here, 
Margaret Gelling thought that old English rand meant sure and thought that uh, Little Shore would be a particularly apt description of Rendlesham's location um, on the banks of the Deben. Um, <clears throat> now, the evidence for Old English Rand meaning Shore turned out to be a bit dodgy, so we can probably dispense with that particular translation. Um, but there is an East Anglian dialect word meaning marshy strip of land lying between a river bank and an embankment. Um, and a place name element referring to a narrow, possibly boggy strip of land would make reasonably good sense here, given Rendlesham's location sort of um, in this area here, um, overlooking um, uh, a narrow strip of wetter land alongside the Deben. So um, I wouldn't like to rule out this etymology altogether. It is, um, I think it remains plausible, um, but as does Bede's um, etymology. So that would be um, envisaging a personal name, Rendell is the first part of the name. So um, it's actually a bit uncertain how we should interpret the first element of the place name, Rendlesham, uh, but interpreting the second element of the name is much more straightforward. We're confident that this second element is Old English harm, this word for a homestead or settlement. Um, and it's worth spending a few minutes on this element since this is our first indication that Rendlesham um, was a little bit unusual. Now, place names with Old English harm are thought to belong to an early layer of place naming in English. We know these names were being used in old, early Old English place names um, because of their distributions and because they're well distributed, sorry, they're well represented amongst the place names recorded by the 730s, that is when Bede completed his ecclesiastical history. These harm names aren't, of course, the only type of early Old English place name, but that's a topic for another day. So Rendlesham is likely to be amongst the earliest English names in the area, which is consistent with the evidence for there being people living at Rendlesham by the mid fifth century who had links with or background in areas on the continent and southern Scandinavia where Germanic languages are spoken. These people might have spoken an early form of Old English and given names in this language, names like Rendlesham. However, Rendlesham wasn't the only place with one of these early harm names in southeast Suffolk. The map on this slide shows Rendlesham and other place names containing the element harm in the area of southeast Suffolk near Rendlesham. The harm names are shown in red. Alongside these, a few other early place name types are indicated with orange and yellow markers um, alongside um, various others kinds of um, major place names shown with um, uh, black, green or blue dots. Um, what's noticeable is that the names containing the element harm, as well as some of the other early names, are all found in the valley, valley bottoms and relatively favourable soils, which are shown in, um, and these are shown in green. Um, the names avoid areas of heavy clay shown in darker colours um, and either avoid or are on the margins of the more acidic soils and heathlands shown in lighter colours. Um, but the other name types are more widely distributed. Um, so this is further evidence in support of the use of a, a river and walled type model here, where most of the earlier settlement names, um, or the names we know are early at least, um, are on fairly good soils in the valley bottoms. Um, okay, so Rendlesham is one of several relatively early post-Roman place names in this area of Suffolk, but it's far from unique in this respect. Um, there are some more interesting things, um, well, there are interesting things going on with the place names in the area around Rendlesham, which are a bit more unusual. Um, so I'll begin by discussing references to the nearby Roman town, Tatcheston. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about Wickham Market now. Um, um, so this name is one of a group of at least 32 um, instances of the compound wheat charm in English place names. Um, these are a pretty interesting bunch of names. Um, now on the surface, the compound looks like it should mean something like homestead or settlement that is a specialist specialised farm. Um, since it's a compound of Old English wheat, specialised farm or settlement and Old English harm, um, the more generic term for settlement, which we've seen already in Rendlesham. However, the distribution of these place names suggests a slightly different interpretation. An interesting spatial relationship concerning these names was first identified by Margaret Gelling. 
Galling observed that the witch harm names were associated with Romano British settlements and more specifically, probably Roman small towns. And um, Wickham Market is a perfect example of this. So we've got Wickham Market over here, um, just adjacent to, so just over the river from Hatch the um, Roman town um, at Hatcheston. Um, now it's unclear when Old English witch was borrowed into English or one of its prehistoric ancestors. But regardless of when the word was borrowed, it's its specific application in English place names that it that is interesting. It implies continued recognition of a particular Roman settlement type. Um, and here we're talking about the small town at Hatcheston. Wickham Market is therefore also likely to be a name formed early in the post-Roman period. Um, and whether the use of this compound indicates anything more than this, for example, that the Roman town was still inhabited or still maintained some form of urban functions, um, is an interesting question, but not one um, I'm sure we'll ever answer. So Radlesham was quite near a Roman town, which was um, recognisable to speakers of early Old English. Um, well, were there, but were there closer links um, other than just geographical proximity? Well, perhaps. Um, I'm going to talk now about the name Wicklaw, which we saw earlier as the name of this um, group of seven hundred, this group of hundreds, the Wicklaw hundreds. Now, in her discussion of Wee Charm names, Galling suggested that other place names where Old English Weech is the first element might similarly refer to recognisable um, Roman sites. Um, I should say that the Weech Charm names have been very pretty comprehensively studied, but these names with Weech as a first element have been less comprehensively studied. Um, there's also one of there's one of these names with a Weech as a first element, um, either in or very near to Rendlesham, the name Wicklaw, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and in this case, the reference may well also be to the Roman town at Hatcheston. Um, but in this case, we don't think the name referred to a settlement. The name was, as far as we know, the name of a feature in the landscape. And this would be a mound in this case. So the name is a compound of Old English witch um, and Old English law, a word for a mound or hill. So this would be um, presumably um, uh, the mound or hill um, at um, or outside Hatcheston. Um, now, similar, sorry, um, hundreds and similar administrative and legal units are often named from their meeting places. And it's a reasonable supposition that a place called Wicklaw was a meeting place for this group of hundreds. Can we say anything more about where it was? Well, of course, um, if we're interpreting the name correctly, then we should look in the Hatcheston area. And indeed, as Keith Briggs has noted, surnames that derive from the surname Wicklaw are found in the Rendlesham and Hatcheston area. Now, the usual suggestion is that Wicklaw was at or near the place later known as Gallows Hill in Hatcheston. That's um, just shown over here on this map here. Um, a site which may have been known earlier as Wicklow Gallows. And there seems to have been um, long term continuity in sites where judicial judgments were made and enacted. So this is quite a reasonable suggestion. Um, an alternative suggestion is that Wicklaw was in Rendlesham itself. Um, and this, um, I'm summarising what Keith Briggs has argued here. Um, Keith has argued that, um, well, he's noted that there's a place called Wicklow Hill, so Wicklow Hill, Wicklow Hill, um, in a document from 1205. Now, unfortunately, um, the parish name is illegible um, in the 1205 document, so the location of Wicklow Hill was pretty uncertain. But Keith Briggs has noted that the same document names pieces of land called Potbreda and Tunleich, and that these names are also recorded in Rendlesham. Um, and actually, in the course of my work on the project, I found another of these names amongst the medieval name material from Rendlesham, um, Lampert. And in fact, I think we can even now locate one of these names, and um, that's Tun um, Tunleich. So Tunleich is a name meaning something like um, open woodland belonging to the Tun, the settlement. Um, and this occurs in quite frequently in medieval documents from Rendlesham, um, but um, I didn't until recently figure out where it was. Um, 
Well, I think this name may actually survive in the 19th century field names shown on this slide. So we've got Great Tilly, Little Tilly and the Tilly over here. Um, and you can see they're in the east of the parish, um, some way from um, Rendlesham and the um, early medieval site we've been discussing. Um, now, the development of this name, so Tunle um, to Tilly, is a little bit unusual. Um, but there's a 16th century document in Ipswich Record Office, which contains a name that looks like an intermediate form between Tunleich and Tilly. And this is um, the, the Tull Tullies, um, so the two Tullies um, um, here. Now, the development of Tunleich to Tully and the development of Tully to Tilly seem quite plausible. So I think um, these this Tilly, these collection of names containing Tilly probably does reflect um, the earlier um, Tunleach Tunley name. Um, and incidentally, we've got more evidence here for woodland being located away from the good soils near the river. So this is a bit more evidence in support of Wicklow Hill, so Wicklow Law Hill, um, being in Rendlesham, although the possibility that there was a meeting place at Gallows Hill remains. Wherever it was exactly, the presence of a meeting place um, for an extensive territory um, in the immediate area of Hatcheston and Rendlesham provides further evidence for the long term administrative um, importance of this part of the Deepen Valley. But if Wicklow was either in or extended into Rendlesham, we would have a more explicit link between um, Rendlesham and Hatcheston in um, the first element of the name Wicklow. Um, and intriguingly, in this respect, um, there may be evidence for Roman, late Roman military activity at Rendlesham, so late 4th century evidence. In her lecture in this series, Jude Pluvier made a tentative suggestion that there was some form of official activity at Rendlesham that led to a few Roman troops being stationed at Rendlesham in, in this period to account for the large number of late Roman bronze coins from Rendlesham. OK, um, moving on. Another indication of Rendlesham's centrality in the region may be provided indirectly by the name Sutton. Sutton is a name that indicates a relationship with another settlement. Um, so the name originates as a label meaning the southern estate um, or the southern settlement. And names like this are widely thought to be labels for parts of larger estates. So we should look elsewhere for the centre of the estate from which Sutton, um, of which Sutton was part. Now Sutton is usually thought to be named, so Sutton down here, Sutton is usually thought to be named in relation to Woodbridge, four and a half kilometres to the northwest, um, or to a hundred meeting place at Wilford Bridge, um, uh, Wilford, probably near Wilford Bridge. Um, however, a couple of people, um, most recently Peter Warner, have suggested that Sutton is named instead in relation to another important place in the Deepen Valley, namely Rendlesham, up here. Um, I think this latter interpretation has got much to recommend it. Sutton is geographically south of Rendlesham, um, much more so um, uh, than it is south of Woodbridge, for sure. Um, Wilford can't be ruled out so convincingly on directional grounds, but I still think Rendlesham is the better kind of it. We know it was a sizeable settlement um, and a 7th century royal estate, um, which makes Rendlesham um, uh, quite a likely um, uh, candidate for naming a place in relation to um, more so, I think, than Wilford. Um, so we have possible indications that Rendlesham was an estate centre encompassing land some distance further south in Rendlesham. Um, unfortunately, the place name evidence doesn't really confirm a link with Sutton to who itself, um, the location of the famous princely burials, usually linked with the East Anglian Royal House. Um, the earliest, that is, 11th century evidence indicates that Sutton and Sutton Hoo were separate land holdings and as you can see from the spellings on the slide um, the place was probably only known as Hoch um, that is the bit that gives us the Who bit of Sutton Hoo at this point. Um, of course if Sutton had been part of an estate centred on Rendlesham it's plausible that Sutton Hoo between Rendlesham and Sutton had been too but the name evidence just doesn't tell us this. So I'll finish by summarising what I've been summarising what I've been talking about. So we've seen how place names were part of the evidence for reconstructing a river and walled type territory with Rendlesham in its core area of settlement in the um, um, particular area of the Deepen Valley. 
And indeed, Rendlesham is an early type of English place name containing the place name element Old English Harm. And like other names with Old English Harm in the area, it's in just the kind of area we'd expect to find the main early settlements, i.e. river valleys. Um, and as a kind of side point here, we can confirm that we don't need to worry about there being an important site away from the river valley at Wooden Halls, which has got nothing to do with a wooden hall. Um, but more intriguingly, we can perhaps make links with the Roman town at Hatchton, which is referred to in the names Wickham Market and Wicklaw. These names must also be quite early, being formed when the Roman town was still at least recognisable and still perhaps um, some sort of significant place in the area. But whether the proximity of Rendlesham to this Roman town indicates continuity in power structures or in the location of seats of power, it's more difficult to say. There could have been continu continuity, but um, equally um, the sort of attractiveness, the attractiveness of the area um, could just have meant it could also support prosperous settlements. If, though, Wicklaw was indeed in or at least partly in Rendlesham, we have a more explicit link between Rendlesham and the Roman town. Um, we've also seen indications of the centrality of the Rendlesham area in terms of both governance and land holdings. The meeting place of the group of hundreds known as the Wicklow Hundreds may have been in Rendlesham um, and Rendlesham may have been the centre of a wider estate uh, extending at least as far as Sutton, um, if Sutton is indeed named in relation to Rendlesham. Um, but we can only speculate that Sutton Hoo was part of the same estate. Now many of the Ideas I've been talking about are possibilities um, rather than certainties um, due to the very limited evidence available to us about the period from the 5th to the um, early 8th centuries when Rendlesham was at its peak. Um, if I'd focused on the, the more secure evidence, so that is the name Rendlesham, the lecture would have been very short indeed. Um, but there are at least several hints um, of the centrality of the Rendlesham area in South East Suffolk in the early medieval period to be found in the place names of the area. Thank you.